All right, hello, everybody. OK, so this is the fifth lecture of the class. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit more about second order ODEs. And towards the end of the class, we're going to get into kind of general high order ODEs with arbitrarily many time derivatives. OK? And towards the end of the lecture, we might get into some matrix systems of differential equations. And next week, we're going to look at linear, uh, linear systems of equations, eigenvalues, and eigenvectors. Okay. So just a quick overview. Uh, last time, we looked at second order systems of equations. And we're going to do that again today. And in particular, we're going to look at something called the characteristic equation. So how many of you kind of remember hearing about this characteristic equation at some point? How many of you have not heard of this before? OK, probably a couple of you. Um, we'll do a little bit of MATLAB. And then we'll get into higher order. So next week. We'll deal with matrix systems of differential equations. So if I have a vector x dot equals a matrix A times my vector x, maybe I have some initial condition vector x naught. We'll learn how to solve these matrix systems of equations using eigenvalues and eigenvectors. OK, um, I'm going to be out of town on Monday. And so my TA, Scott, is going to be in class on Monday doing a MATLAB review. So I know some of you probably are either a little rusty on MATLAB or maybe haven't seen it before. And so on Monday, he's going to just go through a bunch of stuff in MATLAB, how to plot, how to simulate systems of ODEs, how to you know, write a for loop and define a vector and a matrix and just basic stuff. Okay, So it might be really useful for some of you. For others, you might not need it. Don't feel obligated to come. Um, and some of you have asked me uh, if there's a good reference for MATLAB if you have not used MATLAB before. And so I'll point to two things. Uh, first, there is this excellent book by Nathan Kutz over in the Applied Math Department. Um, Okay. It's called Data Driven Modeling and Scientific Computation Methods for Complex Systems and Big Data. Uh, it's $42. It's like a 600 page paperback book. It's now the most, uh, the most frequent book I take off my bookshelf is this one. It's excellent, excellent book. It has MATLAB code for all of the mathematical techniques that he introduces from numerical differentiation to numerical integration to solving PDEs, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. We will cover a lot of material that is very similar to this book. Um, you don't have to buy it, but I you know, would recommend it if you want to learn more about MATLAB or if you think you're going to do scientific computing in the future. It's fantastic. Okay? So I recommend this one more than the course textbook, Kreisig. Okay? The other great reference. Um, the other great reference for anything in MATLAB is MATLAB. If, Sorry, someone needed this uh, up still. Just Google Kutz data-driven modeling, Amazon, and you'll find it. OK, yeah. The other probably, I'm going to switch now. The other best place to learn about MATLAB is MATLAB. So let's say you want to know how to plot something. You type doc plot, and this will bring up the documentation for plot. And it'll tell you what types of arguments it takes, um, all of the different ways you can call the plot command. It will give you examples. So you click on the example button, and you see you know, how you would actually type in the lines of code to make a plot and what the plot should look like. OK, so this is how most of us learn MATLAB is by coding in MATLAB. Just try things out. OK, that's what I would really recommend. OK, so I'm going to do a little bit of MATLAB later. But to start, we're really going to do some analytic uh, expressions with ODEs. OK. Uh, homework one is due today. There's now a box to submit homework in the ME front office. So where all of the homework submission folders are, there's one that says ME 
564, so in the future you can just drop all of the homeworks off there or email them to me in the TAs. That's also fine. I don't like RAR files. Zip files are OK. PDFs are OK. Please don't send uh, RAR files, because I don't know how to unpack them easily. OK, so we're going to keep going with examples of second order ODEs, and we're going to build up kind of general strategies to solve all linear ordinary differential equations. OK, so our example is x double dot plus 3x dot plus 2x equals 0. And what else do I need to specify? Initial conditions. How many initial conditions do I need for a second order linear differential equation? Two, OK? So I'm going to make them easy. x0 equals 2, and x dot 0 equals minus 3. I could have other initial conditions. I could say like x naught plus x dot not equals 5, and x naught minus x dot not equals uh, you know, minus 5. I could, I could just make up any kind of linear combination of these to specify initial conditions, but this is the easiest way. OK, so I told you that we can always solve differential equations using Taylor series, right? And that's good to know. It's good to be able to derive e to the lambda t and cos and sine from Taylor series. But whenever you see a simple linear ordinary differential equation, meaning that there's no products of terms, there's no x dot times x's or x squareds or x dot cubes or anything like that. This is just you know, linear coefficients of each of the terms. Anytime you have a differential equation like that, you can always solve it using e to the lambda t. Always. So doing the Taylor series is like the laborious, difficult way of deriving e to the lambda t for these simple linear cases. Okay? So we're going to assume that our solution is x of t equals e to the lambda t, x dot equals uh, lambda e to the lambda t. This is just review from last time. Now we're going to start plotting them in MATLAB and really interpreting what these lambdas mean x double dot is lambda squared e to the lambda t. And so if I plug all of those in, I have a lambda squared e to the lambda t, 3 lambda e to the lambda t, and 2 e to the lambda t. So I have lambda squared plus 3 lambda plus 2 e to the lambda t equals 0. And remember, e to the lambda t is always positive. And so the only way this can ever equal 0 is if you have a lambda that solves the root of this polynomial. So that's lambda squared plus 3 lambda plus 2 equals 0. Um, this is a really, really, really important polynomial. It's called the characteristic equation. And this tells us which lambda solve this differential equation. Okay, the roots of this equation are the lambda that solve my ODE. So this one's really easy. Um, we can factor this, right? Okay, so it's lambda plus 2 times lambda plus 1 equals 0. And so what does that mean lambda equals? Negative 1 or negative 2. OK, so what is my solution of this ODE going to look like? Right, x of t equals what? Some constant, uh, let's call it k1. Yeah, e to the minus t plus another constant, k2, e to the minus 2t. Okay, that is kind of the general solution of this ODE before specifying initial conditions. And now that I know that I have initial conditions, I can plug those in. So what's x0 of this equation? k1 plus k2. And what's x dot at 0? Negative k1 minus 2k2. And so I made this one really easy. So if k1 is equal to k2 is equal to 1, you get these initial conditions. Okay, So we have uh, k1 equals k2 equals 1. And so the actual solution is 
e to the minus t plus e to the minus 2t. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? In general, if I gave you weird initial conditions like x not equals pi and x dot not equals minus 12, you would actually have to solve this linear system of equations for k1 and k2, right? So you could write this as a matrix and invert the matrix, or you could do it in MATLAB. And we'll do that next week, OK? Uh, OK, so what happens to this system? What happens to this equation for long times? As time goes to infinity, what do my solutions look like? They go to zero, right? They decay. So e to the minus a big number is really, really close to zero. And both of these are minus exponents. So these are decaying to zero in exponential time. Okay? Um, so we're going to plot this in MATLAB. And we're going to make sure that it's consistent with what we think uh, MATLAB is giving us. So there's another trick to solving this where we can write this as a matrix system of equations. Okay? And that's what we're eventually going to want to do for linear systems. It's kind of the most general way of solving these. And we touched on this a little bit in the last class. So I can take this equation, x double dot plus 3x dot plus 2x equals 0. And I can do something called suspending variables. And it's just a fancy way of saying that I'm going to keep introducing new dummy variables until I turn this second order linear system into two first order coupled equations. So I'm going to say x dot equals some dummy variable v. v is usually for velocity. And then v dot should look like x double dot. And it's going to equal minus 2x minus 3x dot. Minus 2x minus 3x dot. And what is x dot? v. OK, so this system of two first order equations is exactly the same as the single second order equation. They're the same mathematical entity. They have the same solution. They mean the same thing. Um, and so I can write this as a matrix. So ddt of this vector, x, position, and velocity, is equal to a matrix. 0, 1, minus 2, minus 3 times my vector x, v. OK, this is a, a nice way of writing a system of differential equations. So I have a vector dot equals a matrix times that vector. And in general, if I had like a 15th order equation with you know x 15th derivative plus a bunch of other stuff, I could add 15 variables and get a 15 by 15 A matrix to represent that, that differential equation. I can do this for any linear differential equation at all. And this is going to be the preferred way of entering these systems into MATLAB. So this is uh, going to be useful for MATLAB. OK, any questions before we start uh, plotting this stuff? Any questions at all? No? Yeah. Um, so for example, then, that you gave there, if, if your initial condition is like a variable, you want to solve the differential equation for like a field, or like, you know. Um, so let's say this x naught was a number a, and that a was a variable that could be anything you choose. You might want to plug in 5, or 4, or 3, or 2. Then you would have that variable here. And you would represent k1 and k2 in terms of that, that variable initial condition. And then these variable constants, you know, if you changed your initial condition so x0 was 5 instead of 2, then these k1s and k2s would change accordingly. Yep. Is there a way to express it if you have a complex solution? Like, like if you have a you want to express i, I something as a complex um, Or do you just have to assume that I'm going to plug in, I'm going to assume 
this solution for complex and then this solution for positive values? Yeah, I mean, so that's a, that's a good question. So sometimes when we, like if I change the sign of this, I might get complex solutions, right? I might get a solution like minus 1 plus i times time. Uh, and so there's lots of ways of interpreting this. Usually you think of the real part as the position x and the imaginary part as the velocity. But that will become a lot more clear when we write this as a matrix system. OK, because we'll have complex eigenvalues, but our solutions for position and velocity have to be real. Right? A mass can never have an imaginary position or an imaginary velocity. So the phase of that complex number has to do with the phase between position and velocity of those sine waves. So that's something we'll get into a lot more. Um, it's a little kind of conceptually tricky, but you know, I think it'll make a lot more sense when we do deal with matrices. OK, so this is the, the equation we're dealing with. I'm going to first of all just plot the analytic solution. Then I'm going to simulate it in MATLAB and see if I get the same solution. Okay? And what's my initial condition, x0, v0? Just remind me. 2 and negative 3. 2 and negative 3. Okay, so it's a vector 2, negative 3. Does anyone know how to? Shit. All right, let's try it again. There you go. Got to be gentle. OK. I didn't realize how much I cussed under my breath until I watched one of my videos. <laughs> OK, uh, can everyone in the back see the screen? Yeah, good. OK, so as always, I clear all of the memory. I close all my figures, and I clear the command window. It's just a nice way to start a MATLAB script. OK, so I want to plot this from t equals 0 to 10 in increments of 0 0.02. So t is a vector from 0 to 10, and it has increments of 0 0.02. Fine, so t is a vector of data. And I'm going to say x equals e to the minus t plus e to the minus 2t. I'm going to plot time versus x in black. OK. Good. Looks like an exponential decay, right? I start with my initial condition 2. And it very rapidly decays to something nearly 0. OK, so now I'm going to hold on. And I'm going to, instead of writing down the analytic solution, I'm going to simulate that system in MATLAB using ODE45. So ODE45 is just a fancy, very accurate numerical integrator. It solves using the Runge-Kutta fourth order scheme. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so we need to define an initial condition. So y0 equals 2, 3, a vector 2, then minus 3. We have an A matrix, which is 0, 1, minus 2, minus 3. And we have ODE45. So, so it's going to give me an output of a vector of time that it evaluates, and then this vector of y. y has two states, so there's going to be position and velocity. Okay, y is going to have two column vectors. That's going to equal ODE45 of, uh, I have to define a function, the right-hand side of my vector field. So y dot equals a times y. This is my right-hand side function. Okay? And I can do that in MATLAB using function handles. So this is something if you don't know about, you can Google. It's really simple to get used to it. So I'm going to define on the fly a function of time and y. And that function is a times y. That's it. That's the right-hand side function. I'm going to integrate for time in this vector t from 0 to 10. And I'm going to integrate initial conditions y0. OK, so we have a little more time today. Are there questions about ODE45 and function handles and any of this? There probably should be. This 
makes sense. How many of you think you can use OD45 to simulate an equation? How many of you don't? OK, so what you need to know is how to take your differential equation and write it as a first order system y single dot one time derivative equals some function on the right hand side of y. Okay? Then you define that function of y using function handles and you tell it how, how long you want to integrate for and what your initial condition is. That's it. Okay? So try it out. Try it out for a different system. Try it for y dot equals sine of y. Just like in MATLAB at home, try to integrate y dot equals sine of y using this formula. OK, and you'll get a hang of how to actually do it. OK, so I've held my plot. So I have the analytic solution in black. Now I'm going to plot the uh, numerical solution in red dash. And I'll put up a legend. This is my analytic solution and my ODE 45 solution. And I should probably label time. And Y label is my solution x. Good. Okay, and we see that the red dashes pretty much perfectly overlay our analytic solution, which is nice. This really is exactly the same representation as what we had over there. It's just another way of solving it. Okay. Any, any questions about this ODE? Do you mind if you figure a nice question? Can yeah. Sure. In the, the last plot, yeah. the second term. Uh, this one? No, no, no. Y oh, yeah. yeah. So this y colon comma 1. Good. So what is y colon 1? So size of y, it's a 501 by 2 matrix, which means it has two really big columns. Those columns are uh, x and v. So there's a column for x in time, and there's a column for v in time. Okay, so that's what, that's what y is. It's two columns, one for x, one for v. And I just want to plot the first column. I'm, I just want to plot the x position. Okay. Okay, good. We're going to keep going. OK, um, so now what if we just make this a little bit different? Um, let's make this a minus 3. Now what changes? And I'm going to change my initial conditions a little bit. OK, so now I have x double dot minus 3x dot plus 2x equals 0 with these initial conditions. So physically, what just changed? What was my original equation? Like, what does this kind of physically represent? Or what could it physically represent? A spring mass damper, yeah, with a, with a damper, right? So this would be what term? The damping term, right? This is my frequency term. This is my damping term. And earlier I had positive damping, which is good. The universe is built on positive damping. What about when I make damping negative now? So originally my solution decayed because faster velocities got damped out more aggressively. Now faster velocities are going to accelerate. And so this should go unstable. Physically, we think this should go unstable. Okay? You should always have a physical gut feeling for what your ODEs are telling you. Okay? This doesn't change. Uh, here I just have a bunch of minus signs. Now this is minus, minus. So what's the solution of, of this characteristic equation now? We can still factor it. So now it's just lambda minus 2 times lambda minus 1 equals 0. And now instead of being negative, my lambdas are positive. And That's my solution. And notice I changed my initial condition so that I still had the constants k1 and k2 equal to 1, because I don't want to solve those systems yet. OK, so if I have negative damping here, then I get positive exponentials, e to the t and e to the 2t. And so as t goes to infinity, these should blow up to infinity. 
Okay, my system should go unstable. So physically, these lambdas are giving you kind of growth or decay constants. If they were complex like you suggested, then there would be some oscillatory component as it either grows or decays. Okay. Um, and there are always roots of this characteristic equation, where you take e to the lambda t, you plug it in, and you get these coefficients times powers of lambda. Pretty nice, clean way of solving linear systems. Makes a lot of sense. OK, um, last example. So this is, I think, pretty relevant for the homework. I don't remember exactly what values I gave, but I think this is pretty close. By the way, for the homework, I should have told you um, you can definitely Taylor expand about the point x equals 0. That would be kind of the reasonable Taylor series expansion. OK, so let's do a final case. So in the first case, we had two negative eigenvalues, which meant that the system was asymptotically stable. Asymptotic means t goes to infinity. In the second example, we had positive eigenvalues because we had uh, negative damping, and our solutions blew up. And so now we're going to have a third case, x double dot plus x dot minus 2x equals 0. OK, how do I solve this equation? What do I do? OK, there's some e to the lambda t. What do I do with it? Take the derivative once and then twice, substituting the Good. I take the derivative once and twice. And I plug it in here, and I get a characteristic equation. So my characteristic equation should be lambda squared plus lambda minus 2 times e to the lambda t equals 0. So lambda squared plus lambda minus 2 equals 0. And how do I factor this? Plus 2 minus 1, like that. Good, thank you. So now we have lambda equals 1 and lambda equals minus 2. So this is a little bit interesting. Okay, now we have one positive and one negative eigenvalue. Um, and so our solution is going to be something like x, to, x of t equals a constant e to the, maya, e to the plus t plus another constant, e to the minus 2t. And what could my initial conditions be? Um, I'm just going to, again, pick really easy initial conditions. x0 equals 3, and x dot 0 equals 0, which gives me k1 and k2 equals 1. OK, so what happens to this system? What, what does the solution look like for long times? Well, right, so this one decays. This one goes to 0. This one goes to infinity. So I have something that's going to 0 plus something that's going to infinity. And so the unstable term always dominates, always. If you have one positive eigenvalue, I could have like a thousandth order differential equation with a thousand eigenvalues, a thousand roots of this characteristic equation. And if a single one of them is positive, then the solution will blow up to infinity and be unstable. OK? So this is an unstable system. And it goes to infinity as time goes to infinity. Now, if I chose a really, really, really careful initial condition so that k1 had to equal 0, then the solution would decay, because there wouldn't be anything in this growth mode. Okay, But almost all initial conditions, if I just randomly picked an initial condition from a hat, it's almost certainly going to have a component in both of these directions, and one of them is going to blow up to infinity. OK. That's it for second order equations. Are there any questions before we move on to more abstract differential equations?
So this has been pretty concrete. These have been real physical systems. Now we're going to go a little bit more abstract. We're going to start thinking about generic higher order differential equations. But I'll try to bring it down to actual examples, OK? So so how do I get a higher order differential equation? Like what? We have good examples of x dot equals lambda x, right? That would be like bunny populations or radioactive decay. We have good examples of x double dot plus x equals 0. That's like the harmonic oscillator. What's a good example of like an x quadruple dot type equation? When would I ever get that? So if I had my spring mass, how would I modify this to make it a fourth order equation? So the dash plot gives me the damping, the x dot. But it's still only a second order equation for this spring. Sorry? Say that again? Put in another spring in a mass. Okay. So now if I have a position x1 and a position x2 that is you know, out, off of equilibrium, then I have two second order equations, one for the first spring, one for the second spring. OK, I'm just going to write out what this is quickly. So it's m1, x1, double dot. This is f, now this is ma, k1, x1, plus k2, x1 minus x2 equals 0. If I mess up a sign, please tell me later. Um, I don't think the signs are off. Right, this is just figuring out the force balance on each of these masses in terms of the displacements and the spring constants. This is two coupled second order linear differential equations. Okay? So they're coupled because each one has an x1 and an x2. So x1 must depend on x2, and x2 must depend on x1. That's coupling. They're second order because each of these variables has second order derivatives, and they're linear because I don't have any. Um, powers of like x1 squared or x1 times x2. It's linear. So this might be a homework question on the next homework assignment. So I'll just tell you one thing you can do. Um, you could write this as a system of four first order equations by introducing a variable x1 dot equals v1 v1 dot equals x2 dot equals v2, v2 dot equals. OK, so this will be one homework problem, is taking these coupled second order systems and writing them as four first order systems, four first order coupled linear equations. OK, so if you want to get a jump on next week's homework, try this one. Or you could write it as a single fourth-order equation. And the way you would do this is you would solve equation 1 for x2. So x2 is some function of x1 and its derivatives. Then you would take two derivatives, right? You get x double dot of 2 equals the second derivative of f of x1. And you'd plug in to equation 2. So this is the procedure. You can try this over the weekend or early next week. And this will definitely be on the homework. Um, so if I solve equation 1 for x2, then x2 is some function that has an x1 double dot in it, right? Right, x2 is going to equal like some x1 double dot plus some other stuff. So then when I take another two derivatives, that x1 double dot becomes an x1 quadruple dot. And so when I plug it in here, I have an x1 quadruple dot plus all of this stuff. And I have a fourth order single equation. Okay, that's just kind of the flavor 
of things. Uh, so I could take this and turn it into a system of first order equations and solve it in MATLAB, right? This is a matrix system of equations, or I could write it as one big fourth order equation. Okay, and you can do this. We'll, um, we'll look at this a little bit more next week, and this will definitely be on the homework. Okay, so let's say that I had some fourth order system of equations. I had x, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus 5x, 1, 2, 3, plus 2x, double dot, plus x dot, plus 7x equals 0. How would I solve this differential equation? Guess what? What's a good guess for a linear system, a linear equation? E to the lambda t. Okay, so x equals e to the lambda t. X dot is lambda e to the lambda t. X double dot is lambda squared e to the lambda t. Triple dot has three lambdas. Quadruple dot has four lambdas, and so on and so forth. Right? If I took the 597th derivative, I'd have lambda to the 597 e to the lambda t. Okay, this works forever. And so I take and plug these in, and I get a higher order characteristic equation. I get lambda to the fourth from here, plus 5 lambda cubed, plus 2 lambda squared, plus lambda plus 7 times e to the lambda t equals 0. And when can this possibly equal 0? for any lambda that solves this polynomial. Okay, so lambda to the fourth plus five lambda cubed plus two lambda squared plus lambda plus seven equals zero. This is my characteristic equation. And how many roots of this polynomial are there? How many unique lambdas are going to solve this? Four. There's going to be four solutions to this equation, four lambdas, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4. Okay, so there's four solutions. What if I had an x, you know, a sixth derivative term here? Then how many lambdas would there be? Six. Okay, so there's four solutions, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4. And my solution, x of t, is going to equal some constant 1, e to the lambda 1t plus constant 2 e to the lambda 2t plus constant 3 e to the lambda 3t plus constant 4 e to the lambda 4t. Now how would I get these constants? Initial conditions. What kind of initial conditions? Well, I need four of them, right? Because I have four unknowns, so I need to know four things. What are some reasonable initial conditions for this system, for this physical double spring mass system? Yeah, so really I'd like to know the initial position and velocity of both of the masses. That would be a very reasonable physical initial condition. Or if I knew the initial position and first derivative and second derivative and third derivative of one of them, I think that would also work, right? So if I knew like, you know, the position and three derivatives, that would probably also work here. Okay? So this is extremely general. Any higher order differential equation with any number of derivatives, as long as it's linear, you can assume e to the lambda t, plug in, get this characteristic equation, and solve x in terms of e to the lambda t's. Okay? If these lambdas are complex, then we're going to get sines and cosines. If they're positive real, then we get exponential growth. If they're negative real, we get exponential decay. Okay? If they're, you know, if lambda equals minus 1 plus i, then I'm going to have an exponentially decaying envelope, and my solution is going to oscillate as it decays. Okay, and the velocity will be 90 degrees out of phase with that. So the real and the imaginary part of e to the i uh, minus 1 plus it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to, it's in my mind part of the process. I always go from here right to here, right? Like once you get really comfortable with this, you'll recognize every, every derivative of x is a power of lambda, and every coefficient just multiplies that power of lambda. So you can go right from your equation to the characteristic equation if you like. That's fine. I haven't come across anything like that. I can't think of it off the top of my head. It's always good to know when you're solving something equals zero, like there is another term here and it can't equal it cannot equal zero. Okay? So for this equation, why don't we try to write this as a matrix system of four first order linear equations? Okay, because that's going to be something I really want us to get good at in the class. Um, because it's going to allow us to use MATLAB and use linear algebra like eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, and it's going to be really, really helpful in the future. Okay, so we had um, x, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus 5, x, 1, 2, 3, plus... 2x double dot plus x dot plus 7x equals 0. Soon we're going to start adding forcing to these equations. We're going to start actually you know, pumping energy into the system. Maybe I can, in my spring mass system, maybe I can move the platform. Or I can have you know, an electromagnetic adding uh, force or momentum to this. For now, we're going to keep this homogeneous equals 0. OK, so what do I do to turn this fourth order single linear, linear equation into a system of four first order linear equations? OK, so I want to introduce dummy variables. So x dot equals v. But I need more, right? That only gets me, OK, so v dot is like x double dot, right? So let's make a new dummy variable. Oh, this is bad. Let's try x dot equals y. Let's try y dot equals x, y, z. Let's try z dot equals uh, a. <laughs> a dot equals b. OK, so we're at x dot. This is kind of like x double dot, x triple dot, x fourth dot. OK, so this is my x quadruple dot, right? a dot. And that equals. Uh, sorry, so x dot, x double dot, x triple dot, x quadruple dot. So a dot equals x quadruple dot, and it equals minus all of this stuff. Okay? So it equals minus 7x, minus x dot, minus 2x double dot, minus 5x triple dot. OK, but I've just taken all of the time to introduce names for these. So x dot is y, x double dot is z, and x triple dot is a. So this is the same as saying ddt of a vector x, y, z, a. That's going to be some matrix times x, y, z, a. OK, so what is x dot equal? Y. OK, so it's 0, 1, 0, 0. If I multiply this, I just get y. y dot equals z. So that's 0, 0, 1, 0. If I multiply that row vector, I get a z. The next one, z double dot is 0, 0, uh, sorry, z dot is a. And a dot is all of this stuff, right? It's minus 7x, minus 1y, minus 2z, and minus 5a. This is my matrix linear system of first order differential equations. And the solutions lambda to my characteristic equation are the eigenvalues of this. So lambda 
are eigs of A. Pretty cool. Okay. We're going to look way more in detail at these linear systems of equations in terms of the matrices and the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. We're going to go way deeper. Um, but I just want to kind of bring your attention to the fact that we can always do this. Any questions? So what's kind of interesting about these characteristic equations, when I have a second order differential equation, I get a quadratic in lambda, and we can solve it using the quadratic formula. If I have a cubic or three derivatives, I get a cubic function of lambda. And does anyone remember how to solve a cubic equation in lambda? So there's a method. This, it's named after this guy named Cardano. Uh, I think he must have been Italian. If you had a fourth order equation like this, there is a, an analytic expression. I could write lambdas in terms of like square roots of square roots of all this nasty stuff. Uh, Ferrari invented that. But for fifth order equations in general, if I had, you know, 17x12345, there is no analytic closed form solution to fifth order and higher polynomials. How many of you have heard of this result before? Right, this is called the insolvability of the quintic. And I believe Gauss was the first person who ever proved this. It's really, really hard to prove. Um, it's not that fun to prove either. Um, interestingly enough, you can prove it with a ruler, sorry, with a straight edge and a compass. You can prove that there are no closed form solutions to fifth order and higher characteristic equations. Um, but what's really neat is that we're able to take differential equations, right? This is calculus, rates of change of rates of change of rates of change. We get this calculus-like expression here. And we're able to turn it into a purely algebraic expression. All we're looking for is roots of a polynomial or eigenvalues of a matrix. They're equivalent. So the last thing I'm going to show you in the last two minutes, this is assuming I can get the screen down. No. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to show you Remember we had this A matrix for our second order damped harmonic oscillator? And what were the eigenvalues for that again? Sorry, what were the lambda that solved that characteristic equation? Right, we had minus 1 and minus 2. Okay? So if I look at the eigenvalues of my A matrix, I get exactly the same eigenvalues. Oh, you can't see, sorry. These are the eigenvalues of this A matrix. OK, so when I wrote that second order system as two coupled first order uh, equations, the eigenvalues of my A matrix were exactly the solution, the roots of my characteristic equation. So this is something we can always do numerically, is even if I have a 100 order characteristic equation, I can't write down analytically the solution. I could write down this 100 by 100 A matrix and find its eigenvalues. That will always work. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about next week. Um, how many of you have like have seen eigenvalues and eigenvectors and feel pretty comfortable with them? How many don't feel that comfortable? Okay, so we're going to go from scratch and really understand what these mean, and we're going to get a geometric interpretation of these differential equations. It's going to be one of the most powerful things we do. Okay, have a good weekend.